Ahoy hoy gang, if this is your first time with us, welcome, and if you're joining us from our previous video, hey hey, we love to see it, and I hope you're doing well. Hey hey, a totally new review, and this time about something completely different. I, yeah, I'm gonna put the cart before the horse on this one gang, I actually wanted this show to be good. I wanted it to be the magnum opus of the Daily Wire brand. To be this new age family guy built to be edgier, grittier, and unapologetically offensive. Because like I've said before in the past, I used to actually be a pretty big Adam Carolla fan. Even enjoyed the Adam Carolla show on many an overnight shift. The man understood what it meant to be a shock jock and was entertaining at it for a time. So an animated comedy from him... There was at least some potential to be, you know, good in a way. And then, you know, everything else happened around it. This show was billed as too offensive for the networks, as one of the most triggering shows you'll ever see as you clutch your pearls and feel your man bun shrivel in the face of this peak masculinity on screen. And what we got was nothing. Just, yeah, just absolutely nothing. I'm going to go more in depth in the background, but if you just want to skip it, I've included some timestamps. TLDR, Mr. Bertram isn't anything, and it isn't even worth a joke watch. Let this be the last you indulge of Bertram. But we'll get into it. So, what worked? What failed? What? I, I don't know. Meal Team 6 antics. Yeah, yeah, you're in for a treat. We'll be curtailed. Yeah, it's Mr. Bertram Season 1. Let's, I don't know, get her done. While Wikipedia will point to Mr. Bertram's origin as Adam Carolla's character Bertram on Crank Yankers, that's not entirely true. Bertram, seemingly inspired by Adam Carolla's old shop teacher from when he was in school, was a voice Adam Carolla had been doing on the radio since the 90s. In the beginning, he was the old man yelling at a cloud about how today's youths were wearing different clothes or had different colored hair, and they'd never survive in Vietnam like he did. Now again, in the beginning, that was part of the joke. Bertram was old and backwards in the 90s. Then, as Adam Carolla got more popular, he tried to work the character into more things, including The Man Show, where he all but didn't call the character Bertram, and of course, Crank Yankers, where the character did have some success and an idea was born. He came up with a whole spinoff focused around Bertram. This was going to do it. This was 2011 after Obama had taken the idea of comedy behind a shed and put it down Old Yeller style, and he was going to save traditional comedy! I, I even have a clip of- Hi, TV reviewer. You've gone too far. And who are you to tell us what the hell? No wonder you hate the show. You're everything we make fun of. You're Jewish, conservative, pro-life, born-again, overweight, Asian, homophobe- Oh, oh my, I'm, I'm so sorry. Seems I mixed up Spanky from the 2010 Drawn Together movie and Bertram from 2024. Oh, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. Oh, my word. Yeah, edgy comedy was real dead in 2011. Always Sunny wasn't still on its meteoric rise. Family Guy, American Dad, and in just a couple years, we'd get the most softball baby animated series of all time, Rick and Morty. BoJack Horseman, Paradise PD, Inside Job, Captain Fall, and that's just the edgier stuff I can think of on Netflix alone. Comedy didn't get softer, its audience got smarter, and Bertram in 2011 was already feeling just a little dated. Though I can kind of see where Adam Carolla was coming from. In 2008, he was attached to a project where he was the gruff coach that made fun of a bunch of armchair, liberal, environmentally conscious family members, and that project got shuttered after one season. That was the good family that, after having seen Bertram, was somehow the better show. Yeah. This made The Good Family not look that bad, and it came out 15 years before it. Not to mention Drawn Together that got cancelled after three seasons and brought back for a movie that was not received positively. Because the movie was bad? No, 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 no. Obviously it was because comedy is and was dead. Yet, I can understand his cynicism for comedy at the time, because if we watch the pilot, which we will, it was actually totally fine. I am genuinely surprised no studio wanted to pick it up, and hot take, it probably would have done well on streaming, not, you know, whatever this is that we actually got. So yeah, he did the Bertram voice on the radio, got offered to make the show for Daily Wire, and what we got is, yeah, I just, yeah, let's, let's just get into this. Alright. 
felt like I had to add this part just so we're all on the same page, because this is actually a series that might warrant this. Uh, I just want to set these since the show we're going to talk about has more than a few landmines packed inside it. First and foremost, I'm not looking at this as a conservative comedy. I'm not comparing it to other Daily Wire projects because that would require me to watch other Daily Wire projects. No, I'm going to look at it compared to other adult animated comedies, the series it's trying to be like. This series was hailed as being too offensive compared to other shows, and I want to see how well that statement holds up. Second, any critique I have of performances are purely based on the performances and not the individuals themselves. A lot of voice actors will just take roles to pay their bills. I don't judge Rob Riggle, Danny Trejo, or Patrick Warburton for being on the show. Hey, you gotta get that bread. But I'm also going to critique the usual Daily Wire player performances the same as I would any professional voice actor. Basically, I want to be as unbiased as possible in this review so that we can see why this show failed without any slant. I don't want people coming to my comments saying I was unfair or being just too whiny about it. I'm being fair and critical. So with that out of the way, let's talk about why I was personally offended this show was created. And here it is. Here's the whole reason I'm offended the actual show exists. It's 9 minutes and 20 seconds long, and frankly, really not bad at all. If this pilot didn't exist, I would have shrugged the entire show off and said, oh boy, the most blatant tax write-off of the modern age since Acme v. Coyote. But after having watched this pilot, honestly, if I was Corolla and this got shopped around and rejected, I'd be a little jaded about the industry too, for all things considered. Mind you, there are plenty of great pilots that never get a full show made out of them, and this isn't a one-off story at all, but man, there is actual passion and creative integrity at work here that is just totally absent from the show proper. It has an interesting art design, transitions well into its cutaway gags, has really emotive voice acting from talented actors, including Pamela Adlin of King of the Hill and Adam Carolla actually going all in on a character he's been doing professionally for over 30 years. Years. This was crafted by people that cared. Bertram is a stepdad who's ready to retire and the people around him absolutely acknowledge he's behind on the times. He thinks he's infallible, but even his wife shies away when he goes too deep on his insensitivity tangents, which is subtle, yet effective, comedy. I know I'm basically offering the most softball criticisms, but comparing the pilot to the first episode of the proper series is night and day. The tangent about Peanut Butter and George Washington Carver is just, like, you could cut this pilot to screen with no edits, and the too offensive for network TV taglines might have actually meant something. Again, probably not, since even this is run-of-the-mill for anime comedies of the time, and even more so today, but still edgier than the kids' safety scissors series we get. This pilot turned my detest of a show into just sheer disappointment in a broadcaster I once looked up to and enjoyed. I grew up enjoying Adam Carolla with my family and aspired to have my own show one day just like him. I thought he was great as a teenager and even listened to him when I was in college. He was someone my grandpa and I would laugh at together even if I didn't know what I was laughing with. I was having fun with my grandpa, that's all I needed. I would have watched this show, this Bertram, every week. I would have probably even been a passionate fan that was bummed when no new episodes started coming out. I would have absolutely been an audience for this show, and I have to believe I wouldn't have been alone. Now that being said, I'm not sitting here saying it's the best anime comedy of all time. Absolutely not. But much like Brickleberry, it has an audience. It had comedic potential. And like Brickleberry and Paradise PD are offensive. But what makes their comedy work is not only are they offensive to just about everyone, but they at least know how to attempt to play it off. There is at least some thought behind what they're doing, even if you don't think about it. It never feels like the jokes are ever trying to dig deeper, and that's fine. They know their surface level, and that's fine. The Bertram pilot didn't reinvent the wheel, but at least it was fun and got a couple chuckles. It was a show I would have greenlit in an instant with my whole chest out with pride. If Fox had actually put it up instead of, say, Alan Gregory, I don't know. I see it getting like three to four seasons and would have been perfectly fine. What we got instead is just so offensively nothing. It makes me question if Adam Carolla ever cared at all. Pilot is a well-polished eight out of 10.
Remember how at least unique the pilot looked? Get that out of your head right now, otherwise you're just gonna get depressed. Yeah, this animation is bad bad. It feels closer to a commercial made on a shoestring budget to remind the elderly about signing up for AARP and advanced Medicaid benefits. It's just cheap and cheap looking. Now, that being said, 2D rigs can absolutely be done effectively and I don't have a problem with animation that reuses shots or models at all. Even Royal Crackers made a lot of cost-saving animation choices that while you could notice them with a fine-tooth comb, were expertly hidden by an animation team that cared. There is no care here. The titular Mr. Bertram is of course played by Adam Carolla. His friend and confidant Mr. Gage is played by comedian Alonzo Bowden. The two are walking into school on the first day back when they run into the new Jedi, or just, you know, guidance counselor at the school, Carponzi, played by Tyler Fisher. He's a heteronormative, cisgendered white guy, and he apologizes. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Bertram and Gage are called toxically masculine and they sneak another LGBT joke in. I... what? Mr. Bertram introduces his student aide Brad and his patented donkey system. Oh, and there's a kid named Beef who says his name, which is Beef. Only the best. So if you get enough donkey points, you sit in the donkey corral and the points are arbitrary because he gives a girl points just because her name is Bentley like the car. Let's excuse the fact that Bentley's been a name since the 1800. I say that as someone that knew someone named Bentley growing up. I understand it's a rare name, but it wasn't after the car. And it's just, that's, I know that sounds like a nitpick, but there's so many jokes like this that it's just like, it makes you scratch your head. Now, this is where I found the perfect example of why this show just completely and utterly fails. Principal Bortles comes in with Mr. Carponzi to tell Bertram that he can't show his blood on the bandsaw safety video. Now, in the pilot, not only do we see the bandsaw safety video, but kids are passing out, vomiting graphically, and just freaking out, which is how you do a joke. You go over the top. You make people uneasy, and that elicits comedy. Here, they cut away from the video to show the reactions to just save money. The kids are throwing up directly into cans, so they just have a can in front of their face. Again, it's just very, very cheap and feels watered down and nothing. Speaking of watered down and nothing, Principal Bortles is played by Roseanne Barr, who absolutely reads those lines. Look, Roseanne does not do a ton of voice work. Her voice doesn't really lend itself to it. That's why you've really only heard her in things like Down on the Range or Look Who's Talking To, opposite Bruce Willis as a talking baby. So here she's just so muted and uninspired. She just feels passive like she just wants that paycheck and like hey you get that money you get that bread tyler fisher just had this character for carponzi in his pocket and decided to whip it out and i don't know what adam carolla is doing with bircham i this this just sounds so hollow and phoned in even from the pilot there's no motivation or heart behind any of his or any of their deliveries it's just them reading it's honestly depressing but we get Bertram's family and the B story. Whee! Make it stop, please. Brett Cooper plays Bertram's stepdaughter, Jeannie, who is into woodwork and really anything her stepdad is into. Kyle Dunnigan plays Bertram's son, Eddie, who's a 20-year-old basement-dwelling streamer, and Megan Kelly plays Wendy, Mr. Bertram's wife, and probably the most horrifying character model in the entire show. What is happening with her throat? She looks like a thumb that grew arms and legs. To the show's credit, I do like that Eddie is a successful streamer over him just being a lazy college kid. It at least makes him unique enough. Wendy bought their dog vegan food. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha, and dogs don't like that, they need meat, and wants Jeannie to help her stage a house. There are two very glaring issues with this episode that kind of carry over into the entire show. One, there is so much dead air, so many nothing lines. Bertram does a whole bit about clicking 33 instead of 30 seconds that goes on for like 15 seconds way too long. And that's a ton of scenes throughout the show, which is weird because the show is actually 27 minutes long, which is longer than a traditional anime comedy would be at around 21 to 23 minutes. Meaning you could have easily cut four minutes of content and made the episode way more streamlined and had the jokes be much quicker and sharper if you cared. Also, to another prime example, there is little to no audio or music design whatsoever. 
Think about an episode of Family Guy. You always have the opening sting, the cutaway music, and different tempo setting ambient background music. It's nothing complex, but it helps with animated comedies and has since Merry Melodies was a thing. Bob's Burgers really plays with instrumental accenting to their jokes as well. Mr. Bertram has some music during cutaway gags, but it's so underleveled you're struggling to hear it, and when you do, it's just the most bland, freeware music you've ever heard. Audio mixing is an underappreciated element to animated comedy that these people don't know about or just don't care about. Anyway, Genie fights with her mom over painting a fireplace for a showing and mocks the Green New Deal because eight-year-olds understand what the Green New Deal is. And the A story has Mr. Bertram taking the kids out of school to fix his deck and facing a disciplinary hearing for his behavior, which like, okay, okay, now hang on. Now, I was lucky that my school had a career center where electives were still available, and I did take woodshop and even an advanced woodshop and metalworking class that taught me a lot about handyman skills that I admittedly let rust. Now, those electives aren't being taken from schools because of some liberal agenda, but because of the increased importance of state-mandated testing in schools. We absolutely watched scary safety videos, and our parents had to sign consent forms. If you didn't watch the safety videos or pass the safety exam, Guess what? You didn't use the tools! Wow! Effective! My point is, none of this happens. None of these imaginary situations could ever really feasibly happen without just consequence. Nothing remotely close to this is happening today! Who in their right mind takes a bunch of kids to their house and hands them tools to fix their deck? Have you ever heard of homeowner's insurance? He would get fired and kicked out so fast! Even in King of the Hill, when Hank taught Woodshop, he took the kids to fix things around the school and taught them practical lessons in the process. And that's a great episode. But here, Mr. Bertram acts victimized and singled out for being punished for taking a bunch of characters off school grounds for manual labor, which at that point could be a character flaw of his, but everyone eventually just sides with him instead, and he's shown to never be wrong, taking away any interesting elements to his character. <sighs> Okay, you know what? Though to be fair, the first episode of any series is usually its weakest. Maybe the second episode will be better. All I know is if this is how you're sold on the show, if this is what you made free for everyone to watch and to sell them on your product, it better be something incredible. And what we got was nothing. Welcome Back Bertram is a corralled 2 out of 10. Our, I guess, cold open has Bertram prepping his fellow Navy veterans for Veterans Day, where they can all gorge on free food for their service. He proudly calls his squad Meal Team 6 and gets ready to square off against his rival Gunderson, played by Rob Riggle. I don't think they worked hard enough to reclaim Meal Team 6. Everyone knows that's an insult, right? Like, I'd, I'd have to hope. You need to have everyone looking side-eyed at each other, knowing that's a horrible name, as he says it with confidence. And I'm talking, he busts out the vest with the name on the back, and he strides out. That's, that's how you reclaim Meal Team 6. Also, I kind of have to wonder if this episode had already been written years ago. SEAL Team 6 took out Osama Bin Laden in 2010. Later in the series, we'll get a reference to 127 hours that, while a bit older now, would have been fresh when the movie came out and, you know... 2010. Just seems like these are recycled ideas, I guess. Also, Jeannie can't join them for their Veterans Day blowout because she has school. School on Veterans Day. Now, I, I might be old-fashioned, but I've never had school on a federal holiday, but that's just me. Again, the show is just lazy. Like, I know this sounds like a bunch of nitpicks, but if you ask even three questions, it just starts falling apart. There's so much they could have omitted, and yet it's still just way too long and way too bloated. The B story has Wendy setting up the wives annual spa day, and we get Gage's wife Dina, played by Sage Steele, in really her only major appearance. Though, she would originally be played by Candace Owens, and apparently have a heavier role in the series that had to be edited out of the show and redubbed. Which, it's funny they had time to edit her out, but thought all these jokes needed to stay in. See, I know in my edits, I really just speed up the footage I'm talking about and try and make it line up with what I'm droning on about that you all think is either really entertaining or nails on a chalkboard, and both are valid! But here I am, I am willing to admit I am an atrociously bad editor. 
But for once, I think I'm actually doing a series of favor by doing this. With it sped up like this, the animation doesn't make my eyes bleed nearly as much. The, oh, the show is just so static and jarring in the worst ways. We get the Army Squad versus the Navy Team, and Gunderson is a character that has a name. This, honestly, his character just proves Rob Riggle is a professional. Because even though the script is nothing, he is absolutely trying. And that's a proud veteran right there. I'll always respect Rob Riggle, especially for his service, but God love him for trying to put some kind of charm in a nothing show. Now see... I thought the school open on Veterans Day was just going to be an opening joke gaff that you could just shrug off. But no, the school is open, class is actively going on, and they're skipping to eat their fill and the principal skipped to school Bircham on how to properly party like a veteran. Just so everyone knows, since awesomely enough I do have some international viewers, uh, Veterans Day has been a federally recognized holiday since 1979 in the US. This isn't something that's recent at all. Like if you've had kids or were a kid in the last 50 years, you know that Veterans Day is a day that schools are traditionally closed. It's just, why? There is anything else you could have done. Make it be a job site thing or a proper rivalry between the Navy and Army guys sabotaging each other back and forth, back and forth. You could literally take away the element of the school being open and it changes nothing about the episode overall. It would have been so easy to find a way to make this story work without making some impossible situation, but no, they went with the laziest route imaginable and didn't give it a second thought. This show does not respect its viewers. Also, and this was odd, there's censor beeps. Why? This is on streaming. It's okay. I can handle the no-no words. I'm a big boy. Check the I am an adult box and everything. But then we get a montage of all the places Gage is thrown up, played to the weirdest track I swear is shovelware. Oh, and Wendy and Dina get into a fight over a charity from 13 years ago, and Wendy's saying Dina is her black friend and start arguing politics and white guilt. I just, I'm like 90% sure Rob Riggle did a lot of his recording in his own home. This audio mixing is just garbage. It sounds like he recorded in a cardboard box and is just jarring compared to everyone else in the show. It almost sounds like they recorded him recording over a Zoom call. Like it sounds like speaker to speaker recording or like someone that does podcasts a lot just brought him into a Zoom call and recorded it like that and didn't manage his levels at all. All oh, I just, oh. The Navy and Army teams get into a fight literally five minutes before the end of the episode, and good lord, it's hollow. I guess Bertram applied his son's advice to camp the spawn point. The script is just so paint by numbers and still manages to feel lukewarm at best. I'm not about to say it's disrespectful to the troops or anything, but it definitely didn't respect my time. Thank you for your meal service is a slop throwing three out of ten. Bertram's dog pisses on his table saw. That's it. That's the cold open. I, it's just, ah, uh, okay. We find out that Gage's name is Don. That's cool. We never really, like, we get told later on what Bertram's name is. It's actually Richard. His name is Dick Bertram. Also, another small detail that you'll never be able to unsee if for whatever reason you decide to torture yourself with this, the flag in front of the school never waves. They couldn't be bothered to use a repeating shot of the flag flying in front of the school to establish beginning momentum in an episode and instead just let it hang there sad and pathetic with a standard P and G. It's, honestly, it's downright unpatriotic. I don't know. You'd think a show so loud and proud about American values would make that flag the biggest one in the county and flying high. It just, it feels like, again, they don't care. If you are a Daily Wire subscriber, you deserve better. Any paying consumer deserves better than what Bertram delivered. Like, it is, it is disrespectful to its viewers. Mr. Carponzi hires Bertram to make a stage for his play and bribes him with new tools. The play is Romeo and Romeo, where they don't have the pronouns you expect. Get it? Do you get it? Aren't you laughing yet? In Bob's Burgers, Mr. Frond works as this weird guidance character because even he understands he's too much sometimes. He has other facets to his character. David Herman actually does put in some really terrific voice acting, making him sound almost neurotic in the best way. Carponzi is a cheap knockoff. 
He's just a mind-numbing hum of nothing. Anyway, Bertram's table saw collapses somehow. The B story is Wendy having her son help her social media to get the most views and get that sweet, sweet top listing. I don't care. I, okay. They make up Whistler's mother joke about how James Whistler should have gotten a real job like working in an opium den instead of being a painter, since obviously he didn't have the balls to make a painting called Whistler's father instead. That, you know, James Whistler was encouraged by his mother to be an artist when that's not actually true. James Whistler was encouraged to be an artist by William Allen, of all people, while his family was in Russia. Also, just a really dumb thing to point out, but Whistler's mother came out in 1871, when his dad had been dead for several decades. His dad couldn't have told him anything, lest he be visited from beyond the grave. I know that's a dumb thing to point out, but like, who is this joke for? Who remembers the Whistler's mother? I only did because I took a humanities course, and even then, it was a fringe memory at best. They bleep their swearing and bring up Whistler's mother. This is some Southern Baptist priest's favorite show to talk about with the other boys while hiding that he's going to enjoy a second Paps Blue Ribbon without letting the wife know. So, you know, he's going to be especially rowdy when he giggles at the Whistler mother bit. If you're offended by anything in this show, you are not a real human being. You can't be. You would have to have no self-respect to be offended by a series that doesn't even respect itself or have the courage to actually make a joke with some hair on its chest. They make a Mr. Beast joke, Sears is closed, and that's obviously bad for some reason, and Eddie is getting product placement making bank off of it, but apparently he's still a loser streamer. Tools are now like iPhones, and you can't get real tools anymore. Last I checked, DeWalt was still very much in business. It just feels like this is made by people that haven't built anything in the last 10 years. Wi-Fi hammer, good vibe drills, and a stud finder drone, all totally real and totally valid reasons for Bertram to yell at an employee about something they had exactly zero hand in developing. Again, as someone that worked retail, that's boomer attitude, all right? Though I'll admit, a stud finder drone that could find places in your home where you're losing heat so you know where to put insulation or could detect leaks would actually be a kind of neat and effective idea. Saves you the risk of getting on a ladder on uneven ground. Oh no no no, technology and tools should never be combined. I guess I'll take my laser level elsewhere. It's just such a dumb argument. I, it's just, I, I don't know. Cool. Wait, you're telling me the table saws were all eventually made by the same company and marketed them as three different products and it's time to fight the Chinese at Tula Palooza? Are you done yet? Oh, it's okay. Adam Carolla even bashes himself a little by, you know, saying he thought Gilbert Gottfried was dead. Again, just unearned and unnecessary. What did Gilbert Gottfried ever do to you? I don't know. Like, in, in Smiling Friends, he's God. In Royal Crackers, they give him a touching send-off. Here, Adam Carolla looks at Adam Carolla and goes, Wow, I thought Gilbert Gottfried was dead. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Why? Seriously, just why? It's just cheese hot tubs and lifetime warranties so the Chinese can spy on you through your tools. That's the whole episode. I just... Okay, it's just more nothing. It's more emptiness for the sake of nothing. I have never seen a show spin its wheels harder, and it's just disappointing. Adam Carolla doesn't even sound like he could be bothered to do a performance even half as good as he did 13 years ago. The man has lost his passion, and he is not hiding it. This means warranty is an expired 1 out of 10. Bertram is stuck in a lathe and high on leaking acetone fumes and imagines himself happy and dancing with Mr. Carponzi, which again, I've seen the rumors that the animation studio that worked on this wasn't thrilled they had to work on it, so I'd absolutely believe they threw some gay coding into the series as revenge. I don't know. There's a lot of Bertram and Carponzi art I never would have expected to see and it was being thrown under official Bertram posts, which I think is a wonderful form of revenge, but please, don't do it. It's not worth it. I don't know. I imagine if you upset the animation team, they're not going to want to put a ton of effort into your project. Not that that's a problem for this show. I love all my animated comedies to be a brisk, you know, four frames a second. It's sad when I can't tell if it's buffering or just how bad the animation is, and I've got fiber internet. There's 111 genders. Do you get it? You having fun yet? Halfway through the season, let's finish strong. Carponzi tells Bertram to redo his grades so they're more uniform and less offensive so he can go camping for spring break. 
Yet, while he's trying to submit the grades, he gets stuck in his lathe again and can't get free again. You know, just like in 127 Hours, that hit movie from 2010 that I haven't thought about in well over a decade, that was like three James Franco cancels ago. It feels like all they did was add gender and socialism jokes to scripts that were finished halfway through the Obama administration and called it a day. Who is this for other than just boomer humor? Wendy and Eddie decide to fix the floor to show Bertram they can fix things too. We get a flashback to Bertram's childhood and how he loved the Burly Man meals with the Burly Man mascot being played by Patrick Warburton. His mom drank a lot and hated construction workers and astronauts, so naturally he wanted to be as manly as possible and work in construction. Hey, look at that. Actual motivation. That sure is a story element. Oh, and then they just sort of time skip to two days later all of a sudden. Bertram gets left by his newly discovered lesbian ex-wife in a flashback and just keeps hallucinating until his tools are coming to life and he's making a loose Pink Floyd the Wall reference with one of the worst musical numbers I've ever seen. All culminating in Tool Lives Matter. Tool Lives Matter, people, which if you think on it for just a second, Boy, howdy, maybe we should have just picked Wood Lives Matter. Because if you look at this joke at even a surface level, you go, ho ho, hang on now, gang. Maybe, maybe not, though. Tool Lives Matter is a play on Black Lives Matter where tool equals black. Hang on, wait. See? Maybe Wood Lives Matter instead. Now, if this is a dog whistle, that is one of the only creative things they've done in this entire show, which would be horribly, horribly racist. Now, that being said, I don't think that was the intention. I think it was just a really, really, really dumb joke. I'm, I'm going to attribute that one to ignorance, not maliciousness, because that that whole musical number is just horrific. I mean, it's just none of this is good. Again, it does not respect the viewer at all. Eddie and Wendy call Jeannie to come home and fix the leak, and she does a Pulp Fiction reference. Oh, and we find out Bertram's real name in this episode. You know, we it just it takes him four episodes into the series to tell you his name's Dick. He gets saved from the lathe from his student, and everything is a return to normal as Gage gets attacked by a bear. This was their emotional episode. This was the potential season finale or series finale idea, I imagine. I imagine that when this episode was written 13 years ago, it was written with some amount of care to humanize Bertram while also showing that, yeah, he's always been this gruff and his alcoholic mom drove him to the world of woodwork and construction, but it never quite sticks the landing. It's just too lazy to actually put that work in. Instead, it feels like a ripoff of Downer Ending from BoJack Horseman's first season. He hallucinates various points of his life to explain why he is how he is, except they don't really pay off outside of he loves his son and Wendy thinks he's hot. Ironically, we never see why Jeannie loves him so much. You'd think that could have been an angle. Having this little girl looking up to him and listening to everything he has to say while Eddie is an edgy teen and he starts to soften up around his little assistant and be a proper family man would be a good idea. But no, that would require nuance and care. That would require creative effort. 127 hours or so is a dated 2 out of 10. I'd give it a 3 out of 10 for the musical number, but this is one of those few rare instances where the musical number actually somehow makes the episode worse. Tool lives matter. My god. Seriously, respect yourself and never watch this show. Wendy signs her family up for Homes for Humanity, which you'd think Bertram, the wood lover that he is, would be excited about it, but no, no, he isn't. Remember when Hank had to build a Habitat for Humanity house for his boss and loved doing it? Made sense for his character and was delightful. Here they have to explain why Russell is a funny name for a crowbar. Different audience, I guess. The school is banning the Sadie Hawkins dance. Didn't even know they still did it to begin with, but apparently this is an issue. Jay Moore guest stars as the coach in this episode that teaches Bertram and Gage how to be men. Bertram takes his student helper Brad under his wing to get a date for the aforementioned Sadie Hawkins dance. Oh wow, they made a Britney Spears going bald joke, which would have been dated in 2011, much less 2024, but hey, what 17 years between friends? Danny Trejo, acclaimed restaurateur and actor with incredible vocal talents, gets to play Switchblade in this episode. He's got like four lines. Remember Enrique in King of the Hill? Nah, forget that nuance. It's just he has tattoos and looks scary. But don't worry, he knows construction. That's his whole character. 
Oh, and look, the humanity group is led by Mr. Carponzi, and Bertram is apparently still riding the vapors as he's visited by the burly man and his coughing bear. Okay, I, I heard it with Rob Riggle, but I hear it way more here than I did in the last episode. Patrick Warburton is clipping. How is he clipping in a professional show? Do you know how easy it is to stop someone from clipping? You turn down their mic and ask them to redo. It is audio engineering 101. I just, the fact anyone can put their names on this show with pride is baffling to me. I'll say this, Warburton is the best part of the show and got the closest thing to a smile on my face. The habitat falls apart and so Mr. Bertram tries to actually get some work done. Oh, look at that. Wendy is a staunch Obama supporter. That'd be great joke material in, you know, 2011, dated in 2024. Man hasn't been president for eight years. It's okay to get over it. I found the dumbest thing they ever did, though, and it's it's kind of magical. If this is a shot from the animation crew, kudos to Yudos. Brad tries to impress girls by reenacting Roadhouse and even wears a black shirt. Except, the black shirt is just his normal shirt, but they use the black bucket fill-in tool on his shirt for the rig to show he's wearing new fashion. I can't. I, I want to meet a real and true fan of this series. I really, truly do. Because I genuinely don't know who this show is for. The only people watching the show are for spite. Between the weird references, the spotty at best animation, and the odd true-to-their-heart moments, it just doesn't have any idea what it wants to do. I'm not saying Danny Trejo's bankruptcy is why he showed up in this show. I'm just saying you can tell he wasn't paid for more than two takes, and much like Riggle and Warburton, his audio sounds off. He's not clipping, but he's just so soft. It feels like the totally opposite problem. It wouldn't be such a big deal these things do happen from time to time, if they weren't so glaringly noticeable. If they put some music in the background, you could at least mask it a little bit, but that would require too much effort, I'm sure. You gotta mess with like three whole knobs. Might as well send it and grab a beer instead, right gang? Oh, the humanity is a habitual one out of 10. The climbing rope is taken down in the gym and Bertram is determined to put it back up. Never even had a rope climb in my school. Too much of a liability issue. I'm pretty sure that's why most of them got taken down. Did plenty of other normal gym exercises, though, but nah, this is the fat shaming episode for some reason. Oh, look, Bertram and Gage were bullied for being fat by their coach, and then they keep that tradition alive instead of, you know, having any kind of introspection. Oh, and did you know marathons lost all meaning because you can have a gaming marathon or a marathon of TV, so running a marathon doesn't mean anything anymore. Are you laughing yet? Surface level. Surface level everything. Oh, and then Bertram gets bullied by the ghost of his gym teacher. So they sneak into the school to reinstall the climbing rope to do... what exactly? If they decide they don't have to use the climbing rope for exercise, they can just, you know, not use it and do anything else instead. However, the rope accidentally gets turned into a noose because it got in the way of the cleaning people, so Bertram gets put on suspension while Carponzi gets evidence to prove that Bertram absolutely put the rope up. Carponzi tries to then blackmail Gage, and I just... I can't pretend to care. The season finale is Bertram going on a drunken bender and then Carponzi getting caught for the blackmail as the entire woodshop goes up in flames. Much like in 127 hours or so, it feels like this episode was supposed to have a deeper meaning to it that it just does not have. Some deeper issues were going to be addressed, and then nothing. Obviously, I think it would have worked better in the original art style and not this baby's first Flash project we got instead, but alas, what can you do? Gang, when I finished this episode, I canceled my subscription so fast, and I gotta tell ya, they make it tricky. They know this isn't a series we're staying around for, but you'll watch it anyway to own somebody. The Jim Rope incident is boring, lifeless, supposed to be the most exciting episode of the season, and wraps everything up and just doesn't do anything. There's no B story, and the A story ultimately doesn't matter, and shows that the show wasted three hours of your time and laughed at you for thinking you were gonna get anything more than a Family Guy clone in the year of our Lord 2024. I genuinely don't know why they do this. Why wouldn't the target demo for this show just go watch South Park or something? The demo is supposed to probably be 18 to 30 year old males, right? Except I don't think it is. Uh, when I say it's boomer humor, I, I genuinely think it was marketed towards boomers. 
Think about it. That's who the audience for this show is. They censor anything too crass or violent to make it overly simplified. They give them easy characters to remember, and I can totally hear someone's grandpa going, I like that beef boy because he always says his own name, which is beef. Like, yeah, if I grew up eating lead paint chips, I'd find that funny too, I imagine. It's just such a boring conclusion to an otherwise wisp of a series. The Jim Rope incident is an up in flames too out of 10. Ah, <sighs> it's done. It's finally done. If I were a lesser man, this series would have broke me. It would have shattered my spirit and put nails where my knees are. I know people will want to hate watch the show or see how bad it is as like a gag party night, but please heed my advice. Let this show wither on the vine. Stop giving it attention. Let this be the last you ever think of Mr. Bircham. The pilot showed us potential. The show proved that that potential would never be realized. I love animation. It shaped myself, much like most of you, into who we are today. I champion its incredible impact and what it can do as a medium. And after watching this, I can say confidently that somewhere along the way, we as a species went horribly, horribly off track, and I don't know if we can ever get back. Animation was a mistake. Miyazaki jokes aside, Bertram is just not worth your anger, pity, or love in any shape, way, or form. It's a lazy series crafted by people who couldn't pretend to care about their audience. If they did care, the audio mixing wouldn't be this non-existent, and they'd at least have tried very minimal edits of what the animation team did to, you know, make it look any kind of better. But they couldn't even be bothered to do that. This series laughs at you for watching it for wasting your time on something no one really cared about at all. It's not offensive. It's not anything. I'm legally not saying this show is a grift or a tax write-off or anything, but I mean, it just the creative impact this show has is negligible at best and will go down in the dumpster of history as easily one of the series of all time. I, I don't know, gang. I wish I did. Like I said, I wanted this to be good. But even if I throw it up against something like Hoops, hey, at least Hoops didn't give me a headache with its animation. A very, very, very low bar to hit. Mr. Bertram is nothing and laughs at you if you ever thought it might have potential. It's cynical, yet never channels that nihilism into anything worth laughing at, and just falls flat. The voice actors don't care, the writers don't care, the animators seem to actively hate the show, so why should you care? Just don't. Just remember the pilot and forget this ever existed. Anyway, that's gonna do it for this episode. Anything you think I was right on, wrong on, let me know in the comments below. And if you liked what you saw, make sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Who knows, maybe it's the hate of Bertram that'll jumpstart the channel. I'll do a, I'll do a in the shadows. Fingers crossed. And if you want to be the first to get more content and fund more videos like this one, consider joining our Patreon or membership programs. And you even get your name on this really cool list. Wowie zowie. Don't watch Bertram. Honestly, you want a series that bashes armchair activists that in just the almost obscenely liberal? Watch In the Know on Peacock. It's a stop motion series created with the help of Mike Judge that tells the story of an NPR studio, and having worked with people at NPR affiliates, I can tell you it's a way better satire series than Mr. Bertram could ever hope to be, and it's still nothing incredible. But my god, it tells a couple actually funny jokes, and it's the exact same length, which is somehow equally sad. And hey, think about it this way. If a show like this could get made, who knows what you can do? The sky's the limit, Super Chief. Anyway, stay strong, keep fighting, and always look towards that horizon. I'll always believe in you, and tomorrow is a new day. I'll see you all next time. Goodbye, everybody.